In this video, we're looking at the IT Watchdogs Weather Goose. This is a rack mounted climate monitor and sensor unit, basically to check things like temperature, voltages, water intrusion, things like that that could ruin your data center. It's got a web interface we'll try to get into. And along the way, we're gonna do some upgrades on the Dell R720 I've got in the rack. Someone slammed it shut with the lid off last time they were working on it. So now the intrusion sensor is broken on it. We'll have to take a look at that. I'd also like to get a new 10 gig network interface in there while we're looking at it. And we'll also try to make some workshop improvements for testing devices like this on my network. Let's get into it. This is a Climate Monitor WX Goose 1, otherwise known as a Weather Goose from IT Watchdogs Incorporated. I picked this thing up because it meets my two primary characteristics for something being interesting. Rack mountable, and it has network access. Plus, just look at this thing. How could you not be interested in what this thing's up to? It also ended up being a little tiny corner of enterprise history that's maybe been glossed over, at least in terms of this IT Watchdogs company. It looks like IT Watchdogs has been around since the early 2000s, and they've got some sort of duck or avian theme to the branding, which I kind of like, despite the logo being a dog here, but watchdog makes sense. Watchdog is a term for usually a hardware circuit that is looking for failures in a device on a constant timer. In fact, they exist in software as well. They're still in the Linux kernel. You can go poke around at them. Looks like in 2006, they wrote a book and put out some ads, a true story about some sort of environmental disaster happening inside a data center. So of course, given the name, and what I've been talking about. This thing has various sensors and monitoring and alerting capabilities to let you know if something physically bad is happening to your servers. Right on the front, it lists temperature, humidity, airflow. So myo ports, light and sound as internal sensors. Move a little bit over. Six volt DC in, I think it takes up to 12. We got a 10, 100 NIC. It's my understanding that this thing has a web interface, which is our whole purpose and point today. Over here, of course, it's advertising that it's web accessible and you can write down the IP address right here. If you change that, it's got some digital remote sensor in, move it a little left. It's really nice of them to write down the defaults. That's pretty cool. Some analog sensor inputs, water sensors, things like that. It's got a built in temperature and airflow sensor. This is a light sensor. That'll be interesting to see in the UI and then an activity light if it's doing anything and whether or not it's idle. And then the previous owner put a in my opinion, redundant label on it. Not a whole ton about IT watchdogs on the internet, but clearly they were making what appears to be solid hardware and there's a software component inside that'll be interesting to look at, I think. It looks like this was around 399 US dollars back when it came out, somewhere around, I don't know, 2007 to 2009. And IT watchdogs is kind of still around. In 2015, they rebranded to IT Watchdogs by Geist. And then in 2018, they were acquired by a company called Vertiv. And this Vertiv company is still slanging out sensors. So I suppose the original company from the early 2000s lives on in some regard. I test a lot of stuff that is hosting its own web interface, and I don't know the IP address. So let me walk you through how I usually test this stuff and how I want to improve my setup. So first step, I'm just going to get this thing on my network. Over here, I've got this panel. These four network ports go all the way back to my main network, my rack. When I say main network, I mean 192.168.1. That's my home network here I have in the house. This one's blank. I think we'll be taking advantage of that one today. There's nothing on the back here. This is just a keystone jack panel, by the way. So I've got these ethernet pass-through keystone jacks. They plug in there so that I can reconfigure this however I want. And then I had some other stuff going on that in practice I never use. And so I think slowly this is gonna start being taken over by network stuff. At any rate, I would get an item like this on my network, power it up, go look at my router. I've got a UDM Pro and I would see what it's reporting its IP address as. And then lately I've been taking this Think Center, running Windows XP, lugging that out, putting it up on the bench, hooking it up, getting its IP on the same network as whatever device I'm testing is. But it's not very convenient. Sometimes what's on the bench is taking up a lot of room already, like a server. I don't have a permanent spot for it. And my screen capture setup is subpar at best. But I do have a server with multiple NICs in the rack. It's running Proxmox with some Windows XP VMs. So what we're gonna try to do today is pass one of these ports through to a dedicated NIC on that machine that I could pass through the XP VMs and change the IPs however I need to when I'm testing things. And that's the perfect excuse to crack open that Dell R720 and put this in there. 
Right now it's got a daughter board with four one gig NICs and then I've got a Mellanox 10 gig PCI card in there. Well, a few months ago I picked up a different daughter board for it, which has two 10 gig SFPs so I can use those DAC direct attach copper cables I've got going in there and then two one gig NICs. So I think this is the perfect excuse. I've been putting this off. Let's tear into that R720 and get this in there. I actually need to get in here because last time I was messing with it to do that home lab cable video, I banged it shut with the lid off and I'm pretty sure I broke the case sensor. I'm 90% sure it used to poke out of here. When the case is shut, it pushes it down and now it's broken off. So the iDRAC always thinks the case is open and so the fans are revved up higher than they need to be. So yeah, that confirms that. I think I can turn that off in the BIOS. A viewer even commented and said something like, man, doing that with the lid off is gonna break your uh, sensor. <laughs> and I said, no, no, got lucky this time. <laughs> Definitely not. So here's our daughter board back in here with the four NICs. Here is our 10 gig NIC that I need to get out. Let's pull this. Just like that. And then looks like I need to unscrew these two, I haven't done this before. Just comes out like that. There's the four port one gig NIC. This one's gonna generate a lot more heat, apparently. Does it even fit? Fits perfectly. We will put the lid on this time. Just like that. I'm not gonna be able to access that thing. It's not on the network right now. So here's the iDRAC integrated Dell remote access controller, remote management console for that machine. And I can launch and see what's going on at the local terminal. So let's take a look at our network setup. We can see we've got this ENP thing and it's set up as our bridge interface for all the VMs in Proxmox. Well, that's the old Malinox 10 gig card. We don't have this interface anymore, so. We do IPA. We can see we've just got interfaces EN 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. The four new ports we just installed. So back in our interface config, there's a million ways to do this, by the way. This is just how I set it up after having eight beers two years ago. Anyway, so we just want our bridge port to be the first 10 gig port in my case here is interface EN01. Save that and I believe we can IF interface down N01. That's fine. Interface up N01. Let's see what's going on now. N01 is up, my bridge is up. So now on my Windows machine, we should be able to ping that machine. And we can. Can we log in? I guess, I don't know why we wouldn't be able to. Anyway, this thing's back on the internet. Well, the network, anyway. And Proxmox is up, we can access it. Let's check if our VMs have network. They do, this is one of my VMs. Okay, onward. You ever have projects you dread and put off forever and ever, even though you wanna do them? This was one of them for me. It took me all of 20 minutes to do that and my machine's back up, my VMs are back up. I didn't wanna have this extra nick in there when I knew Dell was making daughter boards with the 10 gig NICs built in. I don't need this many one gig ports. And yeah, I thought it would just be really cool to have that custom Dell daughter board in there. Dell doesn't make these, but they're for the R720, obviously with the 10 gig NICs, I thought that would be cool. Anyway, our chores are done now. Now let's get set up to test this thing with my XP VMs. I've got a few requirements when it comes to testing stuff like this. I need to be able to easily change the IP address of the NIC I'm testing with. I need to be able to access the device on older browsers. Windows XP has worked out really well in this regard. It's got IE 7 or 8. You can put older versions of Firefox on there. And I want it to be quick and easy. I don't want to have to lug out a machine every time I want to test something. Now, I still will. Part of the experience, of course, is setting up a real machine and playing around. That's still going to happen. But when I'm doing something like real quick, like this thing, I just want it to be easy. Let's get the software side of things set up. We're looking at Proxmox. This is a hypervisor running on that Dell R720 that we were just messing around with the NICs on. A hypervisor is software that lets you run and manage virtual machines on a physical machine. So for example, over here you can see I've got a couple Windows XP machines that we're gonna be messing with shortly. And if we go to the summary of the Proxmox machine and take a look at network, 
we can see we've got four network devices here. To make it easier to follow along, the OS has named our four NICs that we installed with this one card, EN01, EN02, EN03, and EN04. So we can see them here and we see the one that's active is EN01. That's that 10 gig port, of course, the only one with a cable in it right now. And we've also got something called a bridge, a VM bridge. This is basically a virtual switch. It's tied to EN01, R1 physical port with the network cable going into it, and it's got an IP. Basically what's happening is this thing is being passed through as a virtual network device to the VMs. As far as they're concerned, they have a real network NIC and traffic flows through this. Long story short. When I had initially thought about doing this, I was going to do something called PCI pass-through. And that's basically where you actually pass the physical PCI device through to the VM and let it use it. So for example, I could actually pass one of the NICs directly through to the VM without any software layer in between. But in practice, this was going to be a headache. I would have to find the right drivers for Windows XP and get that working, and it just didn't seem practical. My thinking here is that I'm going to create another bridge. VM, we'll just call it VMBR1. I'll get it on a totally different network for now, just so we know we're dealing with different stuff. And I can bond it to a physical NIC. And I'm going to bond it to EN03, which is our first one gig NIC. My thinking here is when I need to change the network to something like 10 dot whatever, I can just do it here, refresh the interfaces, and I'll be able to test on the bench. So let's create that. The way Proxmox works is it tells you the changes it's gonna make. So you can see this is that network config I was looking at earlier. It's gonna add this. I think we can say apply. It didn't fail. And now we have two VM bridges. Now, if we go take a look at one of my XP machines in the hardware section, I can actually add a second network interface and I can make it VM bridge one. So we'll add that. And that's the end of the software for now. Let's actually get the physical wires hooked up. I've traced this one back to the rack. I know the corresponding cable on that side of the wall. So all we're gonna do is plug this in to port 12 here. And then of course we'll plug the other end into the first one gig port on the Proxmox machine, EN03. And hopefully this is starting to make sense. We can plug our test device in right here. And we can see network activity, they're connected. Of course, over on the machine, we can see the same lights. So this is only part of the puzzle. We need to figure out what network that device is trying to use. I found a tool called NetDiscover, and you can point it at one of your interfaces, in our case, the one we just plugged it into, and let it do its thing for a while. It's gonna scan away and try to find who's on the network. Just a few moments later, it found that thing is reporting its vendor as Digiboard. We've got the MAC address and we've got an IP. It's on a 10.240.39 network. Pretty typical. It probably came out of some enterprise and this was one of their local networks they were using for equipment. So now the idea is I can go over and edit my bridge, put it on that network, fire up Windows XP. I forgot a fourth requirement. I need to be able to record this and screen share it reasonably well. And obviously this is better than any local setup I have. So it definitely hits that requirement. Now you'll notice this Windows XP machine has two network interfaces. That is of course, because in Proxmox, we passed through the first bridge and now the second bridge I just made. Now what we're gonna do is get this thing on the same network, I'm just giving it an arbitrary IP address here. Remember how Windows XP would really just kinda jam up whenever you did this? Let's try pinging our super goose. The, the goose is loose. We can reach it, of course, we're on the same network. Fire up old i7. I never remember which one this is. IE7, baby. There you go. It is talking to that thing. I need to go see if there is a default username and password. Well, let's see if it's blank. It's not blank. I'm gonna go read the docs. Hit a little bit of a snag. The only thing I can find online is about the Weather Goose 2. I have a one. Or the Super Goose 2, which has this cool LCD screen. That'd be sweet. And a horn off button. Anyway, they have reset buttons that you'd hit with like a paperclip right under their nick, and mine definitely does not. But on a 13 year old YouTube video about pressing that reset button, there's a three year old comment asking, how do you reset one without a reset switch? Nine months ago, someone replied and said, there's a special username and password, username reset, password is power up, followed by the last four digits of the unit's serial number. So I haven't tried it yet. Let's see what happens. Mine has a couple stickers that look like they might be serial numbers. We'll try this one first. So the last four is 0052. 
I am highly skeptical. Username reset, password is powerup0052. <laughs> you have to be kidding me. The internet still is still a magical place, folks. <laughs> you just saw it unfold before your eyes. This is even better than a reset button because that was gonna clear everything. This thing came from the Phoenix server room. We have an admin contact and a phone number that I will blur out. <laughs> this is great. All right. This is fantastic. Let's have a look around. Let's look at the logs. I'm going to download the raw log data. Yes. CSV. We'll look at that later. Oh, the interface is grinding on this log export. Can't even move around. I'm going to reset the device info so I don't have to blur it out in all the recordings, but Long story short, this used to belong to a company called Atkins Global, which is apparently a Canadian British engineering firm of some sort that's been around forever. I like Phoenix Server Room. We'll leave that. That's a cool server room name. Save that. And while I'm here, I will reset the administrator password. So yeah, I'm able to tell it's Atkins because all the emails were atkinsglobal.com, their old website. They had an SMTP server. They had a time, their own time server they were hosting. Pretty cool. So I guess let's get started. The only sensor I really have is this airflow one, light level and temperature because those are built in to the unit. One of the internal sensors they've named city power monitor. Not sure how that works. I'd have to read the documentation. And then we can see the alarms that they had set up. So they cared if it got too cold below 60 or above 85 Fahrenheit, they would send an email and an SNMP message. And then the city power thing they had wired up, they would also alert on whatever that means. Taking a look at the control section, power egg was another device that IT watchdogs offered that could monitor power of a device, I think. And yeah, not a lot to it. Let's look at the small version for PDAs and other small screens. This is nice. I like this. The WAP version. Oh, see, this is all you need. Look at this. Load that up on your phone. You know everything. I'm not messing with XML. Let's have a look around, shall we? I'm thinking this is generated server side, meaning that thing has, you know, some sort of software running on it. It's not doing a bunch of JavaScript client side heavy stuff like server remote management things like to do back in the day. And now let's load this up in Firefox and see if my new password works. It does. Well, I was going to load up Firefox to watch the network console, but this is a version of Firefox, I think from before the network console used to, what was that called? You'd install Firebug. Yeah, this version of Firefox might be older than this device. So it's got this light level sensor. I'm going to turn the lights off in here for a while to see if it's actually working. Oh yeah, it definitely is. So the light level was 92 before and now it's four because they're off in here. That's pretty cool. So I assume temperature's probably pretty accurate as well. We're reading 73 right now. And yeah, that's basically correct. Here's what was going on in that log file, by the way. It is a CSV file, comma, separated value file. And it's got the seconds ago that things were measured and then various measurements. I think this is temperature and, and so on and so on. And it has the headers here, of course, for what they are, airflow, humidity. It's got 30 days worth of data, but this probably would have been, you know, 30 days prior to the last time this thing was turned on basically, but it did store it. And of course at the bottom 17 seconds ago, whenever I spit out this file, well, I'm like ecstatic that I was able to get into this thing and it's working perfectly. Check out the sweet cable loom. I think you would have mounted this to the back of the rack and had a bunch of sensors coming into it that way. That's why everything's on the front of it, so to speak. I obviously don't have any of these remote sensors or these analog ones. So what I need to do is read more documentation. Maybe we can reverse engineer what's going on here and hook up our own sensors. And at the very least, I need to get an SNMP server going, simple network management protocol server. That would be a huge benefit for a ton of stuff. Lots of devices, especially in the enterprise world that connect to your network can report over an SNMP server and tell you tons of data about what they're up to. So we'll be seeing this guy in the future. It'll be cool to put him to work 24 seven, but I want to see if my new testing setup here that we got going in Proxmox with that Windows XP VM would have helped me with another device. 
the good old wall computer. This is an IBM X3650 M2. I have a series of three videos where I revived this from being absolutely filthy, replacing the main board, and then taking a look at some ADP dealership software, which is incredibly still on the hard drives. And I actually used that Think Center XP machine extensively to test this thing and get it running. And so I want to see if my new setup would have helped me out here. And I think I've got some improvements in mind already. So it's got an IMM right here, integrated management module that allows for remote management of the machine. It's on some wonky IP 206 something, I think. So let's go check out my new setup and see how easy it is to test this thing. Hopefully it doesn't power all the way up. It did not. I can just hear the PSU fan spinning in there. So this thing's got an IMM integrated management module, sort of a little computer inside of a computer. That's the ethernet cord we just plugged in there. We'll let that boot up for a second and see if we can detect it with our new setup. Well, I'm definitely not done yet. So NetDiscover or any other NMAP or ARP scan or whatever tools, you need to know the network. So it's scanning common ones, common internal networks, 192.168, 10.whatever, 172.whatever. I got lucky with the IT watchdog. It was on a 10.whatever. This thing found it right away. The ADP machine on the wall is on 206 dot something. So you're never going to guess that. I happen to know it because it had labels on it and it happened to be true. So probably what I really need is another router in the situation. And I'm definitely starting to have plenty of those pile up. So we'll make this setup a little more sophisticated in the future. But all is not lost. It's simple enough to plug that into my router and know the IP. And it's still very convenient to be able to pass it directly through on a NIC to the Windows XP VMs. So what I mean is until I improve this, I can just briefly plug a new device into my existing router, find out what network it's on, edit my bridge here to match, put one of the Windows XP VMs on the same network, and then I should be able to access the device. Well, there's always more to do, and I am always being humbled by how little I know about computer networking, even after all these years. I think what I ought to do is get a test network going with a router, switches, all that, and connect it up to my VMs through those dedicated NICs. Might use this Cisco 2821, generously donated by a patron named Kevin. If you're watching, thank you. Very excited to put this to use and maybe running a test network is a good use for it. And this video itself was sort of a suggestion from Jesse the Stig, another patron who's got one of these and he wanted to see if we can get it working. So thank you. And we did get it working. That password reset thing was an incredible stroke of luck. Really cool to see this working. Definitely want to reverse engineer or do more research about these sensors. Put this thing back to work. Worst case scenario, it'll actually be a nice temperature sensor for the rack I've got. And I also got that new daughter board NIC inside my R720. That's been bugging me for a long time. So all in all, not some bad upgrades around here. I hope you enjoyed following along. And if you haven't already, please consider subscribing. We've got more stuff on the way this year. And if you'd really like to support the channel, you can go check me out on Patreon. I'm posting basement renovation updates, as well as, of course, a lot of the behind the scenes stuff related to the channel content. Thanks so much for watching, and I hope to see you in the next one.